This is Your Morning Basket, where we help you bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool day. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 60 of the Your Morning Basket podcast. I'm Pam Barnhill, your host, and I am so happy that you are joining me here today. Well, I am so excited to be ending this season on a high note. We have back with us today, Angelina Stanford. Now, if you remember, we had Angelina on episode 41 of the podcast where we talked about fairy tales. She's come back today to talk to us all about mythology, all the mythology of various cultures, and honestly, what even a myth is. This was something that totally made me rethink of how I think about myths, part of our conversation today. So Angelina is back to talk to us about what myths are, why we should be reading them with our kids, and what place do they have for those of us who are Christian. It was a fascinating conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy it. As always, Angelina's enthusiasm for her topic just spills over and makes it so interesting. We'll get on with it right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Your Morning Basket podcast is brought to you by MaestroClassics.com. Give the gift of music this Christmas with Maestro Classics Stories in Music. These beautiful recordings, created in the style of Peter and the Wolf, contain classic tales and educational tracks featuring storytellers with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Choose from over a dozen titles, including our holiday favorite, The Nutcracker, winner of the Parents' Choice Gold Award. It's a Barnhill family favorite, too. All CDs with 24-page activity books are on sale now for only $12.48 with free shipping. And as a Your Morning Basket listener, you save an extra 17% on sale prices with coupon code PAM. Already have the Maestro Classic CDs? Check out the new digital gift cards, which make it easy to gift MP3s for loved ones on your shopping list. CDs are expected to sell out this holiday season, so don't wait any longer to do your Christmas shopping. Visit maestroclassics.com today. That's maestro, M-A-E-S-T-R-O, classics.com. And remember to use the coupon code PAM for an extra 17% off all sale prices. And now, on with the podcast. Angelina Stanford has an MA in English Literature from the University of Louisiana and is one of the co-stars of the Searcy Institute Book Club podcast, Close Reads. In addition to homeschooling her own three children, Angelina has spent more than 20 years teaching in Christian classical education. She has a deep love for myths and fairy tales, and she joins us today to chat about finding a place for mythology in morning time. Angelina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Well, we are excited to have you back because I have to say we have gotten the best feedback about the last episode you did with us on fairy tales. And honestly, it turned out to be like my favorite episode of the podcast ever. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. That was a lot of fun for me. I'm so excited to think that people got excited about fairy tales. That really makes me happy. Well, you know, it's funny. I was uh, just on Facebook yesterday, believe it or not, and somebody made a comment about fairy tales and they said, what's your take on fairy tales? You know, do you read them in your homeschool? And someone I know said, this is my take on fairy tales. And she linked the entire podcast. (laughs) So I'm like, oh, we're making a difference. It's wonderful. (laughs) That's great. That is, that is very exciting to me. That is very exciting to me. Well, so much fun. Well, let's talk. We're going to dive into mythology today, and I have a feeling that this is going to be another great conversation. So start by telling us what is a myth, and then what makes myths different from other types of stories like fairy tales or folk tales or legends? Okay. Wow. Okay. So a myth... 
A myth is a type of story um, and it is a genre. And so as a genre, it uh, does not have an implication of being true or not true, which is um, an important distinction I always try to make with my students because we've sort of, uh, in the modern kind of slang usage, when we say something's a myth, we mean that it is not true. That runs into problems than when you read C.S. Lewis say something like Christianity is a myth, right? Everybody starts thinking, oh, he just said it's not true. But no, he's a literature scholar. And what he's saying is that Christianity is the, the, the teachings of Christianity are in the genre of myth. And they are because myths cover things like the creation of the world story how people come into existence, how it is that we find ourselves in the state that we find ourselves. So in Greek mythology, you have uh, all mythology, you have various uh, creation stories, but in Greek mythology, they would explain how we find ourselves in a state of suffering, for example, with the myth of Pandora's box, that so suffering and darkness and evil was unleashed in the world. And this is how it came to about uh, through this story. Christians have their own myth, again, using this in terms of just genre, in the in the story of the fall in the Garden of Eden, right? That's our story of how it is that we find ourselves in a state of exile from God and suffering and exile from other men. And so myth is a, yeah, it's a type of story. The Bible is filled with lots of different types of stories. You have poetry, you have books of history. Um, I think the book of Esther is a straight up fairy tale. Uh, so in, again, in genre. Uh, so uh, yeah, so so a myth is just that kind of story. It, it, it encompasses a question of how, how we got here and how we find ourselves in the state we find ourselves. So a myth is a story that's trying to make an explanation for things. Right. And so, I mean, technically, the, the first myths were the stories of the gods. So you get to the whole pantheon, uh, Christianity's version of that, of course, again, is Genesis, God making the world. And uh, God doesn't have a creation story, but there, but Jesus does, right? The incarnation. So yeah, so the very first myths would have been the stories of the gods. And then from there, the stories of the creation of men, Pandora's box, um, Prometheus giving fire to mankind, uh, that, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's interesting, and I had never thought about it like that, so I'm going to have to chew on that and ponder that for a little (laughs) while. (laughs) So what is it that really draws you to mythology? Why do you enjoy it? Okay, well, first I realized I didn't answer the second part of your question. What makes it different about, say, a fairy tale? So that they're actually, so you'll see a lot of similarities between folk tales and fairy tales and myths. A lot of them. A lot of myths are the basis for various fairy tales. So the Cupid and Psyche myth, for example, is the basis both for Beauty and the Beast and Cinderella. Mm. So you, you'll see lots of you'll see lots of similarities, lots of the same types of archetypes, lots of the same types of characters, lots of the same types of story structure and pattern. The answer to what is the difference is that a myth, all of the myths fit together into telling one unified story and one unified universe. Um, so you'll see characters from different myths appearing in other stories and they'll overlap and they'll come back. That doesn't happen for fairy tales. Fairy tales and folk tales are completely separate. And so, you know, Hansel and Gretel are not going to go into the woods and run into Little Red Riding Hood, right? That doesn't happen in fairy tales. They're all separate individual stories that do not seek to come together to create a coherent universe, but myths do. And so myths are also, in that sense, sacred, and fairy tales and folk tales are not. Okay, explain that to me. In that sense, myths are sacred. In well, the sense- Go ahead. Well, okay, so so myths would be, um, I guess I, I guess what I mean to say is that in in addition, myths are sacred and folk tales are not sacred. So myths would be something that would be treated as a different type of story, if that makes sense. How are you defining sacred in this sense? Because when I think of sacred, I think of like you know, the tabernacle at church or something like that. Well, the, it, it, the myths were made intentionally to have religious significance in each of the okay. cultures. Okay. So even though there may be, we may confine the gospel in fairy tales, as we talked about in our last oh, episode, yes, the absolutely. podcast, they weren't necessarily uh, written to overtly do that, whereas myths were. 
Right. Now, it gets to be complicated because we don't really know the origins of all of these myths. And, you know, they, they are around for a long time before Virgil or Ovid or Hesiod writes them down. But, the, I, but again, the idea is that they would have come out of some sort of religious context. Okay. Okay. I think I got it now. So they come out. So it's stories, a cohesive story. They're trying to tell this kind of cohesive story of, the, of a religion is yes. basically what it boils down to. Right. Right. With okay. lots of fairy tale, folktale elements. Now, a legend, a legend is a story that has its roots in something real that happened, but then it sort of takes on this fairy tale and mythological quality. So King Arthur is a legend and King Arthur, there's all kinds of scholarship being done to try to locate who, who was the real King Arthur, but the stories about him are not purporting to be history, right? They're, they're mythological and they're fairy tales and um, the kinds of adventures he goes on to have this fairy tale quality. So it's, it has a basis in an actual historical person, but uh, the story itself does not purport to be history grows larger than life. So kind of like Robin Hood as well. Yes, Robin Hood and King Arthur. Yeah, all of that kind of stuff. Okay. So now let's get back to what do you love about mythology? <laughs> so um, I think I told the story last time about uh, fairy tales was, were the first stories I ever fell in love with at three years old. I was given my first copy of A Thousand and One Nights, and that was mm-hmm. my favorite book all through my childhood. But when I was in junior high, I discovered in my school library... Uh, <laughs> this, and I have looked all over the internet for this. Like if somebody knows what I'm describing, <laughs> message me. Like, this is the great mystery of my life, right? What was this three volume set in my school library? These oversized books, absolutely gorgeous illustrations. I was drawn to them immediately. One was a volume of Greek and Roman mythology. The other was Norse mythology. And the third was Asian mythology just gorgeous books. And I read them over and over and over, just completely drawn to them very intensely. More so the Greek and Roman myths uh, rather than the Norse. Uh, Tolkien and Lewis were very initially drawn to the Norse myths. Not so much me. I was definitely more on the Hellenistic end of things. But, But the myths, so what drew me to mythology was the same sorts of things that drew me to fairy tales. It was in reading myths that I was, I I remember distinctly thinking to myself and just really not even sure if I was allowed to say that, but really thinking this sounds like Jesus. This sounds like the gospel. I can see the same story being told in these myths. Um, And I just kind of filed it away and kept it to myself in the seventh grade. (laughs) But that began a list of long sort of obsession of reading these stories and finding the gospel pattern there. And later, you, when I began to take a scholarly approach to it uh, and really set about researching it, I discovered that there was a long history of Christians doing exactly what I do, which is find the gospel elements in the myths. Um, and I was quite fascinated by this. Uh, so, so if we go all the way back to the very first Christians, they had to reckon with what do we do with pagan literature? And pagan literature was mythology. That, that's what there was, right? So you have philosophy and you have the myths. You have Hesiod, you have Homer, you have Virgil, you have Ovid. What do we do with that? And they start wrestling with that. And they can see quite plainly what everyone can see, which is that there are a lot of similarities between the gospel story and what's in the myths. A lot of stories. You know, you go on social media, especially around Christmas, and you'll see these, these memes or whatever uh, of people saying, well, Christianity is not true because look, you, I can show all these parallels to all these other myths, right? Your, your, your incarnated God is, is everywhere. Your, your uh, resurrecting God is everywhere. Uh, your, your mysterious virgin birth is everywhere. And they'll just point to them and say, see, it's just one of many myths. So Justin Martyr wrote a series of... Um, essays, which he gave, well, defenses of Christianity, apologies, uh, which he sent to the emperor. And uh, he said, this was the case he made. You don't need to persecute Christianity because we're not that different from you. In fact, what we believe your own myths tell too. And so he starts tracking in these apologies, the similarities, the the virgin births, like I said, um, and just really kind of picking it out. And he, and he, and he goes on to say, um, that 
so he, so he, he, he takes him along, right, and says, uh, we don't believe stuff that that's that different from what, what you believe. And then he kind of turns the argument and says, but here's the thing. We don't believe it because it's what you believe. We believe it because it's true. And that's why you're ending up with the same stories that we're telling. And he talked about there being seeds of truth. So he lays out this very sophisticated argument that the truth of the gospel is the truth that's imprinted on human beings' heart by virtue of being made in the image of God, right? So, like, so, so this is just the story of reality, and human beings know it in, on some level. And he said, well, so, so the argument he makes is that he thinks the demons twisted up the stories, distorted them on purpose. And broke them into pieces, if you will, and so that they could trick people into not believing that they're true, right? So, so basically, Justin Martyr anticipates all of these modern means saying, see, your Christ is not special. He's Osiris. He's this guy. He's that guy. Justin Martyr anticipates that argument and says, that's what Satan wants you to believe. Satan is trying to get you to see the similarities and to think, oh, therefore it's not true. But I'm telling you the reason that there's similarities is because it is true. So he makes this case. And Christians have picked up that idea. I mean, you can trace a straight line from Justin Martyr all the way to C.S. Lewis and Tolkien who make the same arguments. Um, so Lewis has an essay called Myth, When Myth Became Fact. And that's where he makes the statement that Christian, Christianity is a myth, but it's true myth. It's that Jesus Christ is myth that became fact. It's a, that, that it's a story, but it's also reality. And, and he goes on to say that we should not be disturbed when we see similarities between mythology and Christianity, that that should affirm us. So the early Christians then viewed this mythological heritage, this literary heritage, if you will, and, and saw it as an important part of the heritage of Christianity. So they didn't have this big dividing line of that's the classical pagan world and we're now the Christian world. For them, this was the world God created. Man is made in the image of God. All of us know some part of the truth. So the phrase Justin Martyr used was seeds of truth. They're seeds of truth that have been sprinkled everywhere. And when we put it together, we can see that all stories tell the gospel. So building on, so, so you know, the early churches preserved this stuff. You know, uh, if you read Thomas Cahill's How the Irish Saved Civilization, you know, he shows how the reason we have these books to this day is because Christian monks preserved them with their lives. When the Viking hordes came in, monks died to preserve the classical pagan literary heritage. That blows my mind. As I like to tell my students, I love Homer. I'm not sure I would die for him. <laughs> like, you know, like, this is amazing to me. And then in the East, you had um, the Eastern monks. To, so, you know, when the, when the Roman Empire split, um, the Latin literary tradition went to the West and the Greek literary tradition went to the, to the East. So the, the West had Ovid and Virgil and the, the East had, um, had uh, Homer and uh, Aristotle and Plato. Um, and so same thing, when the Muslim invaders poured into Constantinople, the monks <laughs> grabbed those manuscripts and ran for their lives. And in fact, that's what caused the Renaissance. When you follow the whole history of the world, you know, often you're told things like, so Christianity comes and throws the world into this horrible dark ages and no one knows anything. And then one day we rediscover the greatness of Greece and Rome and we rebuild in the Renaissance, which literally means rebirth. Um, the problem with that theory is where did that stuff come from, right? It's mm -hmm. not like they were just digging in their backyard like, well, what's this? Aristotle, <laughs> we found it. You know, no. It was, it, it was never lost. It was in monasteries. <laughs> it was being carefully preserved. And then when, uh, in 1493, when, when the Muslim hordes, uh, when the Ottoman Turks invaded Constantinople, you know, during that whole buildup, the monks are fleeing west and they're bringing with them Aristotle, Plato, and Homer. And that brings about the Renaissance. That brings it out. So Christians have always preserved these because they saw it as a valuable part of the Christian heritage. So then on top of that, and this to me is just absolutely mind-blowing, early Christians, so now, so now you're talking about late Roman Empire, early Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, they were just 
fascinated with finding the parallels between the gospel and all these different myths. And they would write extraordinarily detailed commentaries on each of these myths, showing where they saw the gospel, breaking it down. This means that just like I did for the fairy tales, right? So this Mm -hmm. is Jesus and this means this, and here's the death and rebirth and, and just breaking it down. All, I mean, just all these famous uh, medieval philosophers, Boethius, for example, um, it, it was to the point where if you, if you had a collection of Ovid, okay, if you had the metamorphosis, that would be one tiny part <laughs> of the manuscript you would get. And the other huge part would have been all the medieval commentaries <laughs> showing you the gospel in, in Ovid, right? I always joke with my class, I want to go into the local Christian bookstore and say, excuse me, can you point me to your Christian commentaries on mythology section, please? You know, like, we, don't, we don't have that anymore, but this was an essential part of the Christian life. And it is from that heritage of Christians interacting with mythology, looking for those gospel parallels, looking for the ways in which those stories shed light about the reality of the gospel. That is where... Um, that is where Western civilization is born. Out of all of those kinds of conversations, uh, medieval literature, which is highly allegorical, highly metaphorical, begins to build on that heritage. And, and, and you can just really see a straight line there. So, so for them, uh, the myths were always the soil of which you know, civilization was going to spring. That was, the, that was the heritage. And they absolutely saw it as an essential part of the Christian life. They saw that these stories and these pagan authors were pointing to Christ even when they didn't know it. So for example, this is why you end up with, so I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about with the medieval literature being built on that. A lot of people are puzzled by why Dante's Divine Comedy has Virgil as the guide. Right. Right? Why does a Christian need a pagan to take him through the underworld on this spiritual journey and tell him how to interpret? Because that's what Virgil's doing. Virgil's taking Dante, the character, through the inferno, through purgatory, and helping to explain to him what it is he sees. Dante doesn't understand it. Virgil's constantly saying, no, no, you're misinterpreting that. This is what this is. And he's teaching Dante along the way. So why? I, I know a lot of people are puzzled by that. Why on earth does Christian Dante need pagan Virgil to show him the way? Well, that's because you, you have a long history of the early Christians calling Virgil a pre-Christian saint. And they, yeah, and they believed for, for many reasons, the Aeneid to be in one, but also his, his poetry, which was very prophetic, um, especially the fourth Ecologue, which uh, the early Christians, if you, if you read it, it, it is a long prophecy of the Savior of the world. And it's written right before Christ comes. And the early Christians believed that Virgil was, unbeknownst to himself, prophesying the birth of Christ. So they saw that, you know, he was tapping into a reality and truth that he didn't even know, that he didn't even have the fullness of. So Dante takes Virgil then, Dante the author. <laughs> I know it's confusing because he wrote himself into the story. So Dante <laughs> the poet takes that idea, right? So he has the idea that Virgil has been pointing us to Christ, and he has Virgil take Dante the character through the inferno and through the purgatory. So as Dante, the character, goes on his own spiritual journey, it is Virgil, the best of the pagans, who is guiding him. And then Dante does this very interesting thing. He does not let Virgil get into paradise, right? Virgil can literally get Dante right up to the gate of heaven, but he cannot get him in. And that was a very Christian idea of the Middle Ages, that that the the pre-Christian saints were being used by God to point to Christ, even when they didn't know. But it's not saving knowledge. It's not enough, right? The church, Christianity, that's the fullness. That's the thing where you take all these seeds of truth, you plant them, and now they blossom into the fullness. That's what people like Dante were doing and Milton and Spencer. They were deliberately building on that tradition and saying, we're going to give you the fullness of what Virgil can give you, right? And this idea that the pagans can take us right up to the door, that they are pointing the way but can't get it a sin, you see this echoed in medieval architecture. So if you look at the cathedral, again, this is something that puzzles us, right? If you go to these cathedrals, there's the cathedral at Sharp that has this. And then the outside of the cathedral are statues of Aristotle, Socrates, Homer, Plato. And you're standing outside this cathedral and you're saying, what is going on? Why outside of a church 
do we have statues of the pagans? Well, it's the same idea, right? They're outside the wall. They get you right up to the door. You go inside, it's the statues of the Old Testament saints, right? Because that's the fullness of the picture. That's, that's what you need to get inside the gate. But that God had been using all of mankind to tell, you know, e even the rocks cry out, the scriptures tell us, right? There is nothing outside of God's purview. He, so the, the seeds of truth are everywhere. And, and men have been saying these in various ways because they can't help but say it. If you say something true, it's going to be a reflection of true reality, which is the gospel. And so in, in the church architecture, you see this. There are monasteries around the world where the outside wall, again, has paintings of the, the pagans. And then inside, it's the saints of the faith. Um, all of those are putting together the same idea, that the best of the pagans were pointing the way to Christ. And now that Christ has come, we have the fullness of that picture. And that helps us to understand why the monks were preserving that, right? Because they see it as a straight line and, and, and they see the pagan heritage as really the Christian heritage. It's our heritage. It's evidence that God has been working in the world this whole time to prepare us for Christ, right? How Lewis says it. You know, the, the, the Greeks were, were asking the questions that could only be answered in Christ. And I love that. I think that's absolutely true. So they, they're giving us this picture, unbeknownst to themselves, in distorted forms. If Justin Martyr is right, then the demons were deliberately trying to distort those stories and twist them up and make them unrecognizable. But it's still recognizable, right? Like, because Satan can only do so much, right? He can't really obliterate the image of God on creation. He can try but he can't. And so when you put it all together, yeah, that's, that's how the early church interacted with it. That's the way I interact with it. It's just a very, very exciting thing to me to think that every story ever told, that every time a human being has opened their mouth to tell a story, they have told the gospel because they can't not. Okay. So we've talked a lot about Greek mythology, and you mentioned North mythology. Uh, earlier, when you were talking about your three volumes, you were talking about Asian mythology. So do we see this same thing in Asian mythology as well? You do. You do. Now, I don't know as much about Asian mythology, but um, when I teach classes on this, a lot of uh, this is one of the things that I absolutely love about teaching homeschoolers. And if I can, uh, if I can give a shout out to all the moms out there doing morning time, it, it it's a dream for me to go in and teach these classes because these kids have read everything. <laughs> they have read <laughs> everything. And so when I start laying out these story patterns, and, and so let's say I take a Greek myth and I, I take them through Orpheus and I show them some stuff. Sure enough, there'll be five kids in the class saying, oh, there's a Chinese myth that's saying the same thing. And here's a Japanese one. And here's this Norse myth. And they'll just, they'll just throw the titles out at me. So, I, so yes, the answer is yes. You see this in all myths across the board, just like you see it in fairy tales across the board in, in all cultures. Mm. Okay, so let's back up a little bit because we've talked a lot about, um, and, and we were going to get to this, like, you know, why should we be reading these things, especially if we're Christians? And I think you've, you've pre-answered my question <laughs> for me there, which is great. Um, but... Why did the Greeks tell Greek myths? Because they weren't telling them to, to get across these Christian truths. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so why, did, why did they tell them? Well, um, so, you know, this goes back to what, what I was talking about at the beginning of what is the purpose of a myth. They told these stories because they were trying to make sense of reality, right? They were trying to answer the question, how do we find ourselves here? How do we find ourselves in the state of the world where there's suffering and evil? You know, they were asking the same questions that human beings ask today. Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? Why does evil exist? These are, these are the same questions that we ponder, right? And so what you find with the Greeks and, and this is still true uh, uh, about modern life, is that you had philosophers who were wrestling with that question, and you also had the poets who were wrestling with that question. And when you're talking about ancient literature and you use the term poet, you're using it differently than you would use it in a modern discussion because all you know, myths and epics, all of it was written in poetry. So when you read about the ancient debate between the philosophers and the poets, that's what they're talking about. Um, and, and if you ever do any research on this, and Justin Marta will use the term the poets and the poetry, but that's what he's talking about. He's talking about myths. That's not the word. They didn't use that word back then. So the Greeks did not call them the myths. It was just the poetry, 
Right. And, and they were the poets. So, so you have the philosophers and the poets, but they're both doing the same thing. Just like we have philosophers today and then we have artists today. We're, they're all coming at the same question. What, what is a meaningful life? Why am I here? Why is there evil in the world? Why is there suffering? What's, what is the good life? What is it that we're trying to do? So, so yeah, they were trying to answer those questions. And in, in answering those questions, the closer that they got to answering them, you know, correctly, the closer that they got to the gospel. So would the Greeks have been telling these poems uh, to their children? Now that I don't know. Okay. I don't, I don't know. Probably, it's probably a similar thing with fairy tales where, you know, stories were not necessarily told specifically to children as a different genre. I mean, we know that the epics, um, which again, were are mythological, you had your traveling bard. And, and uh, <laughs> one of the things I told my students in my anxious class this year was that Homer was Netflix. Homer was the Netflix of his day. <laughs> and it was true. You know, the, so the bard comes into town and, and this is the entertainment. Everybody's all excited and they sit there and you, they binge watch 24 books <laughs> of Iliad <laughs> and 24 books of the Odyssey, right? This is, this is the entertainment. And so I imagine it would have had a mixed age audience just like anything else. Um, but the myths are, are very much a part of who they are and the way that they understand reality. Now, the, the Greeks have a very complicated relationship with their mythological gods. And, um, but, but that is very understandable and to be expected because they were wrestling with a lot of questions that could only be reconciled in Christ. Right? So, so what you see in the discussions of the Greeks. So for example, in the Iliad, right, there's so much tension between what is the will of God? Where does the man's free will come into this? Uh, what is, what is the fates? There's all this, there, there's all this confusion and, and wrestling among the characters, right? Does Zeus hate me? Has he brought this horrible thing onto me because he hates me? I thought I was a good servant of God. Why am I being punished? And Zeus will respond, it's not me. It was destiny. It's fate. I am just here to uh, execute fate. I don't get a say in all of this. And a lot of times the, the wrestling and, and the mental gymnastics that they're doing to try to reconcile fate and free will and God's providence and the will of God, I mean, these are things that are only able to be reconciled in the Trinity. They're only able to be rec reconciled when Christ comes. You know, we, we Christians, one of the reasons that we struggle even to, to understand what Greek mythology is all about and when the, what the stories are trying to say is because we're so Christian in the way that we view reality. And what I mean by that is these, these conundrums have already been reconciled for us in Christ, right? None of us see destiny as something that's opposed to God's will. Like none of us are sitting here thinking, well, you know, God really wanted to save me, but he couldn't because it was my destiny not to be saved. Like, you know, there's no split in the mind of God that way, right? But for the Greeks, they're trying to reconcile all of that. What is it? How does it, how does it reconcile? So, so they're struggling with a lot of things. I'm not suggesting that you find perfectly articulated Christian answers. What I'm suggesting right. is that you find the struggle, the questions that they are asking. Um, and in their poetry and the stories, though, they come very, very close to the gospel. And you see all the same sorts of things you see in fairy tales that, that I talked about you. Well, for example, so let's take just, just the, the kind of typical mythological hero is going to be a demigod. He's going to be a, a half god, half man, somebody like Orpheus or Theseus or Perseus. And he probably will have a mysterious birth. And he's also going to be the son of a king. All right. So. Almost all of these stories then are about a half God, half man of a mysterious birth who's also the son of a king. And he has to go on some kind of quest, which is usually some kind of metaphorical conquering of death or slaying a, a dragon and rescuing people. There's always some version of that. Now, that is fascinating to me, right? The Greeks had some understanding that there is a distance between man and God. There is a gap that has to be bridged, right? And it can only be bridged by some hero who is both a man and a God. Hmm. And so that is the hero that they give us, right? Now, it's not a picture of the incarnation because Jesus is not half God, half man. He's fully God and fully man, right? The fourth ecumenical council tells us that. But the reason why the early Christians had to have that council 
is because you have this long history of demigods, right? And so people are saying, well, Jesus must also be half God, half man. And so they wrestled with that and said, no, he's fully God and fully man. And so then you see then that Jesus is the fullness of what the Greeks were wrestling with. But they did have the sense that the bridge between man and God is too great. Someone has to stand in the gap. Someone who, who both, who can bring together both the divine and the human. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary that they understood that on some level because we see it over and over. Now, after Christ comes, you do not see that character anymore. That character disappears from literature. You have an entirely different kind of hero after Christ, and that's the everyman hero. Now the heroes are ordinary people. If they are above normal people in some way, it is not because of a divine birth, but because of their great virtue. Uh, mm. So their bravery, their courage, their you know, kindness to children and women, that, the way that they protect those who are weaker than them. In other words, the code of chivalry. So the story changes then from the stories of great men who are above us, great men of destiny who have to come and rescue us. This makes sense, right? If you think about it, that the pagan world, all of their stories are about, we can't rescue us. We need someone above us, someone who can bring together the divine and the human. That's the guy that's going to have to rescue us, right? So all of the stories are pushing toward that. And then after Christ comes, no more. There's, there's no more of that kind of story. Why? Because it's been reconciled. Jesus has come. That's no longer the need that human beings are expressing. It's the need that's been fulfilled. Now the stories are about the everyman. So, so whether it's a medieval romance, whether it's a King Arthur story, whether it's a fairy tale, you, you are supposed to relate to this hero. You, 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 can, you can invest yourself at, in his quest and his journey. These are things that I can accomplish too, right? None of us are going to be Orpheus. We're not going to be Theseus. By definition, the hero of an epic is someone that we cannot fully understand or relate to by definition because he's above us. He's a man of destiny who is above us. Um, everything in the story is to emphasize that. In, in Greek drama, the actors would be physically bigger. They would, they would be on these like stilts. They had the huge oversized masks. The reason for that is to emphasize this is not an ordinary man. This is a man of destiny, right? He's the greater than us. So the stories are all about that need. Again, after Christ, needs fulfilled. Storytelling changes. Now it's about the everyman. It's okay, about so how we do that. That, yeah. that was like a bonus. <laughs> that was <laughs> absolutely fascinating. <laughs> that I've never thought about that before. So um, yeah, that is really, really neat. That the just the story itself was completely changed by the incarnation. And uh, wow. <laughs> That's, that's my feeling. Wow. I mean, when I study <laughs> stories, that's my feeling all the time. It's just, wow, wow. You know, and uh, at, the, at the end of the day, if somebody asks me, why am I a Christian? My answer is, and this is my genuine answer, because of the stories. I know that Christianity is true because every story I have ever read has told me Christianity is true. Mm. And, you know, it gives me the chills. It blows me away. I don't even know <laughs> what to do about it. But Well, it I was I was going to you to get to get you to give me an apologetic for including myths, but you know <laughs> other stories in morning time, and I think you did it right there. This is why you know all of these stories are so important because you know we don't have to pound it into our heads. We just simply are pounded into our children's heads. We just simply tell tell these stories, and they're they're going to get it from these stories that. Uh, whether they know they're getting it or not, uh, exactly, they're, they're going to pick it up. You know, all of these truths that are there, because if God can speak to the Greeks, you know, he can certainly speak to our homeschooled kids. Too. <laughs> well, ab absolutely. Right. Even the rocks will cry out, you know, God, yeah. God's story will be told. Right. The voice that proclaims the truth of Christ is going to be told it cannot be silenced. And and it's there if we know what to look for. And so we, we shouldn't be afraid of what we encounter in a myth. It's, it, you know, like Justin Martyr said, like Satan tried to distort these stories. He tried to use them to lead us astray. He failed. And, and Justin Martyr used the myths to make the argument of you can stop persecuting Christians. Right. So it's, we don't have to worry 
that teaching mythology to our children is going to confuse them or lead them astray. <laughs> It, it, it's, it's not. It's really not. And that isn't to say that there might not be five minutes where they're a little confused and ask a question. I mean, long term, they're not going to suffer from confusion. Right. But that is part of what you're doing when you have children is they are, they, they're, they're learning how to categorize all these things, right? You're giving them a whole world and they're learning to categorize them. And, and we're tempted to want to go in there and do it for them, right? But right. that is not, that's not what they need. They have to learn how to make those distinctions themselves. And that takes time. And sometimes they might put things in the wrong category, but just give them, you give them time. And it's much, much better for them as human beings, as children of God, to get to the point where they can figure some of these things out on themselves. I'm not suggesting you just send them on their way. I'm just saying we don't have to micromanage every connection that they're going to make, right? You have to no, that was one of Cindy Rollins' uh, most convicting things she ever personally said to me was, you know, stop explaining the Bible stories. I mean, I was have I used to have in my morning time what I called the Monday morning sermon, and this is my poor children. They just patiently sat there. I could get going on some sermons, but <laughs> you just you just have to you just have to leave it alone, and they will, you know, do what they need. They, they will get from the story what they need to get from the story. But if you'd like, I can give you an example of something that I'm talking about with the myths just really, really quick. My favorite myth is the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Uh, and this is a, and, and so if you're looking for those fairy tale elements that we talked about last time, those, those, um, because, okay, so fairy tales, mythology, and Bible stories are the building blocks of every story, of every story ever written. And so you'll see a lot of the same sorts of things. So the story of Orpheus is the story of, again, a half God, half man son of the prince, son of the king, so he's a prince, he gets married, and right after the wedding, his bride is uh, attacked by a snake on the heel, and she dies. And you've just got, so it starts off, right, you're laughing, it starts off with such a clear picture of the Garden of Eden, right, that, that Christ has lost, Christ lost the bride, right? These, these, are the, these are the metaphors that scripture itself uses, right? Christ is the bridegroom, we are the bride. Well, what happened in the Garden of Eden, you know? We got separated from our groom, didn't we? Christ lost the bride to the snake in the garden, and we died, right? So the gospel story is about how Christ comes to rescue his bride. This is, this is the language scripture uses itself. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's so many weddings and brides and bridegrooms and, and bridegrooms trying to overcome obstacles to res rescue the bride and marry her because this is, this is the gospel story. This is the story that God himself has given us to explain how it is we find ourselves exiled from Christ and in need of salvation, right? So Christ comes uh, and, and he, he dies and through his death descends into Hades, defeats death, rescues his people, comes back up and marries them. So with Greek mythology and the story of Orpheus, same thing. Orpheus loses his bride. He's so overcome with grief by her, her death, that he decides he will go into Hades and rescue her. Okay huge gospel set up all over the place, right? He's going to descend into Hades to rescue his bride, just like Christ. So he goes down there to get her. He has a conversation with the God Hades uh, and convinces him, persuades him to let her go. And he says, okay. And then he does what we see in tons of myths and tons of fairy tales, one command and one consequence, just like we get in the Genesis story. God gave one command and one consequence. We see this all the time. I tell my students, if a story stops and gives you one command and one consequence, this is a guarantee that someone's going to break it and the consequence is going to happen because that's the whole setup of the story. So Orpheus gets one command, one consequence. Don't look back. If you look back, you'll lose her. So you got a little Lot's wife action going there as well. Mm -hmm. So he, he takes her, he gets all the way up to the top right before he exits Hades. He turns around just to see her being ripped away. He failed to rescue the bride. And he wanders around the rest of his life, cursed, and it comes to a horrific end. Now, you can imagine the medieval commentaries that were on this. I mean, just oh, everything yeah. from looking at it as, you know, Christ in the church to the individual life of the soul and the, 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 the ways in which we're looking back and clinging to our past, and that's an obstacle to our salvation. But my favorite commentary is the one that Plato himself wrote. Get ready for this. This is my I get the chills moment, okay? So I'm going to build it up for you because this, this is the money shot. Plato wrote a commentary about why 
Orpheus failed to rescue his bride. Because that's what it is. It's a failed redemption story. All the elements of the gospel are there, except in our story, Jesus successfully rescues his bride from Hades. And in Orpheus' story, he fails. There's a lot of implications we could draw right there about pagan man, right? That he can't save himself. He's close, but not quite. So Plato writes a commentary in which he says, the reason that Orpheus failed to rescue his bride is that he tried to rescue her without being willing to die. Hmm. That the only way to rescue her from death was to die himself. He said he sought to enter Hades alive. That blows my mind that Plato understood that the only way to defeat death is to die. The only way to rescue the bride is to die. This helps us to understand why the early Christians looked at these guys and were like, pre-Christian saints, Christians before Christ. I mean, there it is. Plato is saying our savior has to die. That's amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But Plato kind of warns us against myths a little bit. He thinks they can be a bit dangerous. Can you talk to that for just a second? Oh, I'm drawing a blank. Matt Bianco and I have had quite a few conversations about this. I think that that is being taken out of, in the Republic. Yeah, I, I, from what I understand that that is, that is being taken out of context and, and Plato is referencing something very specific, a specific abuse of literature and not the poets in, in general. Because okay. there are so, so many places that, that he, he references it in, in a very positive way. Okay. Okay. Um, well, and he had a lot of things to say about child rearing, too. I can't remember if that was, uh, now, mind you, I've read about Plato and the Republic. <laughs> I have not read Plato and the Republic. No, so, but I know he had a lot of things to say about child rearing that are yeah, a little iffy. But I wonder if that was where he was... I wonder if it had to do with myths. We may have to look this up. Myths and young people. I don't well, know. I, I, I'm not sure. On the whole debate against the philosophers versus the poets, I've always been on the side of the poets. So I've read more of them <laughs> than I have of the philosophers. Uh, but I enjoy talking to people who are into the philosophers and seeing where we can, where we can reconcile it. Um, but no, I wouldn't know these things off the top of my head. But okay. Justin Martyr makes a very, and as long as we're going to talk about Plato, I'll throw this in here. Justin Martyr makes the case, um, Sir Walter Raleigh makes this case, quite a few people make the case that they believed that Plato was, uh, if not a disciple of Moses, definitely aware of the teachings of Moses and extremely influenced by them. And that Plato is basically repackaging a lot of Moses's stuff under another name. Justin Martyr says, most likely just out of fear of not, not outing himself as a follower of Moses. So there's, there's lots of interesting scholarship in that direction. Huh. You know, that is interesting. Yeah. I mean, again, if you, if you just look at a map, you know, Greece is right there on the Mediterranean and so is Israel. And it's, 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 it's unfathomable that an educated man in Plato's day would not know what was happening on the other side of the Mediterranean. <laughs> Hmm. I, um, you know, you always think about those two, uh, not communities, cultures being separate right. and, yeah. well, you know, the Romans come in and, and things like that. But yeah, there's nothing to say that maybe they weren't. So, all right. right and so just like, so Homer was writing at the same time as Isaiah and Isaiah's prophecy about Christ coming back as a beggar, you know, uh, that's all in the Odyssey. Odysseus, the return of the king comes back in disguise as a beggar and is, abused humiliated and almost killed mm. okay so yeah it, it, it we maybe we should start thinking about how these people might have had contact with each other exactly uh, yeah that's interesting that is really interesting all right so we're coming up on our time but i want to touch on a couple more things uh i think you've made a wonderful case for these stories except for one little thing <laughs> all right let me have it Okay, so, you know, the, the good versus evil, the right versus wrong, the adultery, the violence, the grittiness, there's a lot of that in mythology. And, you know, it doesn't, the, the lines between good and bad just seem really blurry, you know, more so than in fairy tales and other stories. Hmm. So, you know, we don't really want our kids to emulate things like cunning and a quest for power. So speak to that for me. And is there an age where you would kind of start reading myth? 
And then what do you think, which leads to another question, I'm throwing a bunch of them at you. What do you think about kind of the whitewashed mythology? You know, you get like Delaire's uh, Greek mythology for children and things like that. Is that valid? Okay, that there's a that's a lot of questions. Um, I know. So no, 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 it's good. I'm trying to wrap my brain here. I mean, my my first thought, I guess, is that myths like fairy tales were not uh, initially for children, right? You get the same argument with the there's a lot there can be a lot of violence in in fairy tales and and about those sorts of things you just have to use your discretion. I I you know I don't rec I wouldn't recommend somebody read the Iliad out loud to their five and six year old. I mean they're not going <laughs> to enjoy it and it's also intensely violent. So um but but it's but it's not if I can make my little appeal for the Iliad it's not gratuitous violence and I I, I happen to think that the Iliad is a deeply anti war novel and that the, you know when Homer is you know, the violence of Homer is, is kind of like, um, you know, Steven Spielberg's opening scene of Saving Private Ryan, right? It's intended to, to shock you into the, just the <laughs> horror of war, right? But you don't show that to your four-year-old. So obviously there's an age appropriateness of when you think they can understand these things. So obviously parents have to use their discretion. So I do think that something like Delaire's is, a, is very good for when, when they're younger, that you, you, can, you can hit them with the with the main gods, the main stories, um, and you don't necessarily have to give them, you know, the, the full array. And, and again, you, you know, you're going to be looking for seeds of truth. It's not going to be a full picture. And so you, right. a parent will just have to use their discretion there. But I would think something like Delaire's, you're, you're, you're pretty set. I mean, you'd be pretty safe with something like that. The, the same can be said for any story. The same can also be said for the Bible. And the Bible has a lot of intense scenes that are not necessarily child appropriate. And you have to use your discretion on those kinds of things as well. So that, and that's, that's why we start with a Bible storybook as opposed to. Right, right, yeah. right. exactly. And, you're, you know, and, you, and you, you give them the main stories before you start digging into the, <laughs> the weird ones where we could spend forever debating what on earth that meant and why didn't God say it was bad? Because <laughs> there's a lot of stories where God does not in the Bible pronounce a judgment. He just tells the story of something weird and we're left trying to figure out what it means. So I, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a criticism of mythology and a reason not to read mythology, because that's true of every type of story that there's age appropriateness and there's um, what your goal is. And yeah, I, you know, oh, sure. So things like violence and adultery and all of that. Yeah, look, I mean, it, it, it comes with the territory of teaching anything. I mean, I remember I was headmistress of a classical school for a time. And I remember the second grade teacher coming to tell me that they had, she had read the story of Rahab to her second grade class. And the little boy had raised his hand and said, what's a prostitute? <laughs> <laughs> and she answered, it's a woman who goes on dates for money. And he said, oh, my mom does that. My dad buys her presents and they go out. <laughs> And so she came to tell me I should probably call that woman and let her know that her child was probably going to get in the car that afternoon and ask her if she was a prostitute. So there's, <laughs> there's danger in any kind of story. That, that's, that's my point. So you have to use discretion because these ancient stories are, they're gritty and they're not, they're not children's stories. They're the stories of adults living in a very difficult time. Okay. So we have to be, we have to use discretion, but we shouldn't use fear. And I think that's what it comes yes. down to right there. Right. Yes. I know that's a very good way to put that. I like that. Okay, good. Well, Angelina, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us here today to talk to us about myths. As always, it is absolutely a fascinating conversation. And I just want to throw in a plug. Uh, my daughter, Olivia, is taking Angelina's middle school. It's the Good Books course this year and is really enjoying it and learning so much. So I know this comes out in December and Angelina won't um, start talking about her next course until April, but uh, do look for that. And where can we find out more information about your classes and your other offerings? Um, you can follow me at my website, angelinastanford.com and sign up for the mailing list. Um, I'll probably list my uh, courses for next year in February and um, you can uh, find out what, what I've got going on there. All right. That sounds great. Well, thanks so much. Thanks a lot. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about the things I love.
always, always. And there you have it. Now, if you would like links to any of the books and resources that Angelina and I talked about today, you can find them on the show notes for this episode of the podcast. Those are at pambarnhill.com forward slash YMB60. Also on the show notes are some instructions there for you to help you give a rating or review of the podcast on iTunes. The ratings and reviews that you leave on iTunes help get the word out about the podcast to new listeners. So we really appreciate it when you take the time to do that. This is the last episode of the podcast before we go on hiatus for the winter season. We'll be back late in January, starting up a brand new episode. We're so excited about what we have planned for next year, and we hope that you join us then. Until then, keep seeking truth, goodness, and beauty in your homeschool day. Mm-hmm.